Hello and welcome to Cruising Through History with Scott Cruz. My name is Xander. Of course, I'm sitting here with Scott. Scott, what are we talking about today? Well, Xander, today we're going to talk about the use of submarines during the American Revolution. Now, I say submarines and I don't really mean submarines. <laughs> I was about to say, submarine seems like a, like we're talking World War I, not no. American Revolution. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Yeah, this is more of a what was called a submersible, okay. which is sort of an early forerunner of a submarine. And uh, it was used, uh, it was attempted to be used against a British ship um, in 1776. Mm -hmm. And it didn't, it failed, but we can get into that story a little bit later. Yeah, we, so, so what's the difference between a submersible and a submarine? Because that seems like pretty important to know. <laughs> well, the submersible is basically just a one, a one person ship. Okay. Uh, they called it a ship then. It was it really wasn't. Uh, the turtle itself. It was called the turtle, mm -hmm. and it was invented by a guy named David Bushnell. And the the, sh the ship itself, it looked more like a barrel. You know, it was like a, a one person thing. It had um, a propeller screw that would, if you hand cranked it, it would go through the water. So it was, it was completely mechanical. Like you didn't, there yes. wasn't a, you know, didn't electrically try to do no. something. No electricity. And that always, I find that very amazing that a one person could get in it and you have to pump the screw propeller mm -hmm. or, or turn it and to get out to your destination. And where this happened was in uh, New York Harbor. So this wasn't in open water or deep water or anything. Yeah. Um, it was in New York Harbor, which is off the southern tip of Manhattan Island where the East River and the Hudson River kind of meet. Okay. And so, and for our listeners, I'm using hand motions, which you can't see, <laughs> so that's probably not really good. So like two rivers meet, they're kind of close to each other, they meet and then go out into the harbor. So it's Yes, like and that. so the British had sent a huge flotilla to New York. Mm -hmm. um, and you, to put this in the context of what was going on at the time, the Americans had just gotten run over in the Battle of Long Island, which happened in August, and they were really struggling. And the British had all these ships, and they were bombing Manhattan and, and those areas. And so they thought they were trying. I think this is almost out of desperation. They tried this. Yeah, because the British, the British had like one of, if not the strongest fleet at the time. Is so. Yeah, they did. There wasn't really Americans sitting there. Not much they could really do to just straight up fight that, right? Right. And, you know, we think of 1776 and we think of the Declaration of Independence, mm -hmm. which probably just talked about a couple of weeks ago, and, you know, and uh, because of the holiday. And we think, well, there was this Declaration of Independence and yes, there was this war and then it was over. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, 1776, the year itself was almost, it was a very low point for the American army. I mean, uh, Washington was still trying to there was like a Continental Army in, in its infancy, and then there was militia and all these other groups. But uh, they had uh, they were run out of Long Island, and you, you, you know you retreat Long Island, you crossed over to Manhattan Island, and then you know it ends with at the end of the year it ends with the whole attack on Trenton, mm -hmm. which was like December twenty sixth. That's when things started to turn around, and then into seventeen seventy seven. So yeah, I think this was more of a a gambit. In fact, uh, Washington had financed some of this research, near, some of the stuff they were doing near the end of it to get the thing going. But uh, it's, it's just a, it's it's interesting when you think about it because you wouldn't think, you know, you think of a submarine, and this wasn't a submarine, I know that, but it was really the first documented use of a submersible craft in a war, in wartime. Mm -hmm. So, 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 how does that idea like? The guy that came up with this, and what was the name again? Uh, David Bushnell. D David Bushman. How does a guy Bushnell. have this idea? Bushnell. <laughs> How does a guy have this idea to be like, hmm, there's a siege by water. I wonder what we do to get around that. What is What well, was this David, whole thing come up David with? David Bushnell was an interesting character. Uh, he was from Connecticut. He entered Yale College when he was 31 years old, which was kind of unheard of at the time. And that was 1771. Is that old or young for... Sure. At that era, I think mostly you were younger when you, as, as of now, I, well now okay. a lot of people go to college or later. But I mean, life. at the time, was that at, older? Yeah, it was old, it was kind of, 
it was kind of not the norm okay. for a 31-year-old to enter college then. And one thing he came up with uh, was the first idea he had was he figured out how to explode gunpowder underwater. That's what started this. Mm -hmm. So he thought, I wonder if you could build some kind of contraption where you could go under a ship and you could put something under it to blow it up. So it was like he had a he had this he already he invented something that you know works gunpowder underwater. Was, and that's mm. that itself sounds pretty amazing. Um, right. To be the first person to figure that out because you know because I think gunpowder when it's wet doesn't really. I work think too you well. encase it in something oh, like a bomb. Yeah, yeah. That's he also came up with the idea of mines. Oh. Because okay. he it, he he thought well if he hit something it's floating in the water it will blow up so mm -hmm. on contact. Oh, okay. So. That was where his his uh, innovation came in. And his problem was, well, how do I get this to somebody? Is right. how do I deliver this? But the uh, yeah, but and the other thing I should have mentioned is the other th idea he came up with. There was a in New Haven where Yale College is. Um, there was a watchmaker and kind of a guy who tinkered around with a lot of stuff. But he was mostly a watchmaker. Mm -hmm. He was named Isaac Doolittle, and he came up. So what they did is he said, well, you know, you could put a mechanism on there where you could time it. So if you put this under a ship, you'd have enough time to leave the scene, like a time bomb. Yeah. So you'd have it. Like cartoon, cartoon-esque time bomb or like movie-esque time bomb. There's a little bit of a cartoonist aspect to some of this, but mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so him and, and this dude little guy worked together and came up with that idea. So... Um, so it was tried. So that was September 5th, 1776 is when they tried it. Okay. Um, they recruited some, I mean, I don't know who would volunteer for some, something. <laughs> that sounds like, because like, you already talked about the propeller and you have to like spit like, okay, well, tell me about the like actual layout for someone to try it. How did someone get in this thing? Well, you, you would go in, you would go in through the top from what I can understand. There are four replicas of it built. Mm-hmm that are in various nautical museums around the world still today. There's actually a really good book called uh, Turtle. Just the turtle. David Bushnell's Revolutionary Vessel. Okay. And not only does it talk about the history of it, it also talks about people's how to rebuild it. Because unfortunately for history, the ship itself or the craft was sunk because it was being towed on a barge or something and the British attacked it. This was about a month later in October. And it was sunk and it was lost. So most of this stuff comes from these uh, draw uh, plans that Bushnell had, most of these recreations of it. So it's like a big round, looks like a, looks like a, a barrel, if you will. So you go in through the top and um, it did have, uh, so how you would submerge is it had a tank near the bottom so you'd flood it with water and mm -hmm. it, would, it would go down. And then you would release the water and you'd come back up. So it's, mm, that, that system there, that system is still in use in... Using water as ballast, yes, yeah, correct. And boats in, submarine, in submarines and submersibles, that's the same setup. Yes. And so it's interesting that Bushnell wasn't the first one to have this, this idea per se. There was a Dutch inventor named Cornelius Drebbel mm -hmm. in the 1620s. Now, allegedly, there's not a lot of proof of this, but... He was a per he was a real person, but allegedly he built a submersible and he had actually rode down the the Thames River in London in it mm -hmm. and took King James with him. Now the story starts to get a little bit, but there is some speculation that Bushnell was familiar with some of Drebbel's work, and even going back to ancient history, I mean, there's always been the story of Alexander the Great in 332 B.C. being lowered into the water in something like a diving bell so he could. When they were sieging, they were besieging the port of Tyre, uh, which is on the far eastern Med Mediterranean coast in the Middle East. And he was lo apparently he was lowered into this, he was in this glass thing, and he was lowered on chains under the water so he could observe what some of his divers were doing oh. when they were trying to take the port. So, <laughs> and Archimedes, uh, the Eureka guy, mm -hmm. as I call him, you know, he came up 
he had the idea of buoyancy, you know, he experimented with buoyancy, and that's one of the things. So negative buoyancy is, now, I'm not an engineer, whoever's listening, so. <laughs> <laughs> so negative buoyancy, you know, it, it sinks you, but you got to figure out where's the equal so you stay under the water. Now, mm -hmm. the, the turtle didn't go way under the water because it did have a, a pipe in it to expel carbon carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide because mm -hmm. there was only about 30 minutes worth of oxygen in the thing. And I imagine you'd use a lot of that up just cranking the propeller to get it to where you want it to go. Mm -hmm. So Cause that, this seems, because no electricity again, I, I bring that up because this seems like it's physically strenuous to use, like extremely physical task and you only have right. 30 minutes. Pretty much. And Ezra Lee, who, who was a sergeant in the Continental Army, he was the guy who volunteered to go in the water. Oh, okay. And so, and it was very choppy water that day, so I imagine just getting out to the ship. And he did it before sunrise because he didn't want to be spotted. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I imagine that must have been quite, just to get out to the ship, which would have been probably about in the middle of somewhere, that must have been strenuous just to do that part mm -hmm. um, so he did and everything worked until he tried to attach the bomb okay that's where things went awry because the bomb was in a hollowed out like oak barrel little little one mm -hmm. and you could attach it using an auger like a screw and you screw it into the bottom and then it would attach but the thing, the thing that I'm thinking, when I think of like screwing something in, I'm thinking, you know, you go hand drill, you screw something in and it's stuck. No, I out. believe this, the, 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 the turtle had a mechanism that you would put it on top and you could. Oh, you could, but it's still could, manual. Yes, you could screw it, but you were in the, you were in the ship. Yeah. And unfortunately, the British had started putting, they had started using iron under their ships and that was to attach the... The rudder to the, let me see if I can get this. Um, yeah, the frigate, it would hold the rudder hinge to the stern. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, well, they didn't. Really, the Americans didn't know the British had started doing this. Oh. So here we go. Instead of trying to drill in, to hand crank a drill into wood, you're mm -hmm. now trying to do it into iron. Yep. And it's not working. Yep. So, <laughs> so that's not working. So he decided to move down farther on the ship. Mm-hmm. Well, suddenly the ship ascended. No one really knows why. It lost. It 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 came to the surface. They don't know if, if uh, the 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 pilot had made a mistake, and somehow had released some of the water, so it, it it popped up. And by the ship, the turtle, right? Or the, is it the British ship? I'm sorry. Yes, he he popped up right next to the British ship, which okay. was, which was the HMS Eagle, I mm. believe. And he still hadn't been spotted yet, but he thought. This isn't good. I can't submerge again. He did try to reattach the bomb, but it didn't work. Mm -hmm. And daylight was breaking. Meanwhile, some British uh, on other ships had started seeing this strange vehicle in the water and weren't quite sure what in God's name was going on. Right? Like, who would expect something to be there, right? <laughs> right. And so they, so he, he thought the better part of valor was to get out of there. And so... I imagine this chase going on because one of the British ships started to follow him. And, you know, he's hand... <laughs> I imagine this guy doing this screw propeller thing, trying to get back to, the, to, the, to, to land. He did throw his bomb, but unfortunately, all it did was blow up some water. It did scare off the British ship, though, because it stopped <laughs> the pursuit. So the British were dealing with this and like, three different new technologies. This whole submersible thing. Mm -hmm. Then... The the bomb the bomb itself this gunpowder exploding in water right and it's a time bomb yes that's why I think even though he wasn't able to attach it he still had it so he just threw it mm -hmm. and it blew up eventually uh, but yeah it it was really interesting because um, like I said it was sunk, sunk the next the month after that yeah and uh, Bushnell didn't really try to recreate. That he thought it was a failure, so he didn't want to recreate it. He put more of his time into mines and, and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And um, he did actually. Uh, Bushnell did become a member of the Continental Army. 
and that happened uh, in 1778, I think. Washington had come up with a, depart uh, a core of what he called sappers and miners, and so Bushnell became the leader of this. Yeah, and so this 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 sounds amazing to me because when you mentioned the whole the whole propeller, I'm just like, wait, was that was the propeller a thing before this? Like the propeller that Bushnell used? You know, I don't know. And there's it, it's really it was interesting because I was reading this. I kept having some of these same questions, like, mm -hmm. well, how do you get this idea? And but he never really said how he got a lot of his ideas. And I think there's some speculation that this Isaac Doolittle came up with a lot of these ideas too. Oh, so it's like I'm kind of a, he gets the main credit, Bushnell. Right. And Doolittle, the guy is, you know, the really handy guy is like, well, it's almost, try this. it's funny because when I was, when I was looking at this story, I said, you know, it's a little similar to the one where we talked about mustard gas. Mm -hmm. You had this Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Alexander who would have been lost to history had it been not for certain things happening. And for, well, the funny thing about Bushnell is he was actually captured by the British. Really? Wow. In 1779. And they did, he was released about a year later in a prisoner exchange. But I had a feeling, had they known that he was the one who had come up, who had kept trying these floating mines and what they called torpedoes in those days, mm -hmm. I think he wouldn't, they wouldn't have given him up. They didn't know who he was. So, well, and he, yeah. And, and he was at he was at Yorktown too, uh, so he was there at the end. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, it's it's interesting when you think about you know this this whole idea. It's like, first of all, I would never have gotten into the water. I mean, it could have <laughs> just went right to the bottom. I mean, right? but I think it was in the design too. You know, you look at think of diving bells now and think of that. So, mm -hmm. and and things they use. I mean, it's so different. Now there's technology. I mean, you think of, but I, I don't. And it's weird that even though that ship was sunk, that the turtle was lost. Now it could have broken up. No one really knows. No one ever found it. And I don't think Robert Ballard's going to go looking for it because <laughs> it's not the Titanic or something. Yeah, so. it's just a failed little experiment. But, Pretty much. But yeah. but there's a there's a lot of like. Uh, legacy to this one, even though it failed, there's a lot mm -hmm. of legacy because you mentioned, um, you know, time bombs and right. it's first submersible to be used in war. Um, right. Yeah. And so, I guess, what have you seen like as a result of this whole, this whole thing happening? Well, I think the the whole sub technology, we always think it started in the Civil War with the CSS Hunley. I think it yeah, was. Yeah, that one I'd heard about, and that one sunk. Too. Mm -hmm. And so, but um, there is a book uh, called The Deep Dive by Ian Ballantyne, which is like the definitive history of submarine warfare. And he does touch on, I mean, he's the one who goes, that's where I got the Archimedes story from. I never knew that. Mm -hmm. Well, I knew Archimedes had all these inventions and stuff, but I didn't connect buoyancy to, to that, so I should have. But, um, I don't know. There's like this leg, and then all of a sudden the, the, the CSS Hunley appears, and and you know, but even after that, I mean, you don't really hear about. I think what we think of submarines, that's when you start getting it. Like the Hunley was bigger, and that was run by a different locomotive power. Mm -hmm. Then you see World War One subs. Now we're getting into submarines, not yeah. not these little ships. But you're right; it was basically a failure. In fact, the other experiments Bushnell did with mines, like he would just float them down the river. Um, he did try that. They failed, too. They ended up killing two kids, but they didn't really... All they did was alert the British that these things were in the water. <laughs> in the water. So, And there's an interesting sort of postscript to Bushnell. After the war, he went to France. And in Paris, he had uh, run across Robert Fulton, who was also working on his own... Um, he had his, his had his own ideas of these floating mines and things like that. So, mm -hmm. and then he came back to America and died in like eighteen twenty three, twenty four, something like that. So, yeah, that's just that whole idea is that even in the, the propeller system that came about, what the turtle is still used right. today. The same kind of similar systems mm -hmm. and things that I mean when we talk about submersibles, you know. 
I was looking some, some stuff up and it was like submersibles now, a lot of the time submersibles are even attached to submarines. <laughs> like right, they're, right. they're, or deep dive missions like you think Marinus Trench, but they still all use the same ideas that came about right. in this failed turtle. Right. Like this, I, I imagine this turtle is flipped over the whole time, essentially. That's what it was, but the, the idea of having a shell. Right. Uh, and what's funny is people said, well, that doesn't look like a turtle, it looks like a clam <laughs> it, in its shape, but. I think it was more of a barrel shape, so I think that's where you get because how Bushnell described it was that he looked it looked like he had put two turtle shells together, and that's how the name came about. Whereas people thought it looked like a clam, but I, looking at it myself, I don't really think it looks like a clam, and I don't know if it's that important. Well, it's even <laughs> like shooting date. barrels in the water. That's what it sounds like to me. It's like, oh, it's a it's a barrel, right? Yeah, right, and it's still a mystery why it why it ascended mm -hmm. and didn't stay under the water. It had to be some kind of pilot error, and uh, and it's funny because Ezra Lee himself, he was a sergeant in one of the um, one of the units that were got beaten up pretty badly in the Battle of Long Island. So they had wondered if he uh, volunteered for this to sort of clear their honor, mm -hmm. you know, because it wasn't going well at that time, and even the later battles, and that's what you, know, you hear about. We always hear about Trenton, but we don't really hear about how Washington got out of New York. And he, he did several river crossings, not just the famous one, mm -hmm. uh, into, into New Jersey. And he knew to keep sort of zigging and zagging to try to avoid the British. In fact, you know, his, his, his legend only grew because of certain things that happened. Like when the morning when they retreated off of Long Island, I think it was, somehow a fog had rolled in. So the British weren't even aware that they left. So when the fog lifted, they were gone, you know, like it was magic or something. Yeah. What did, what did Washington think about this turtle thing? Because you said he funded some he of it. He funded some of it. I think he was looking, he was always, you know, he was, he had these other side interests. He was always very interested in like uh, intelligence and spies and things like that. I, this doesn't have anything to do with that, but I think he was just seeing if, the, if it would work. And, and I think uh, Bushnell had corresponded with, uh, Benjamin Franklin too, and because these were all Enlightenment people, mm -hmm. so they were always interested in in you know improvements as they would call them, or they were interested in science. They didn't call it natural science, is what they would call it, or natural philosophy, or something like that. So, so I think for them this is all kind of neat stuff, but of course it didn't work, and um, but of course it didn't, uh, even if it had worked. I, I, I was thinking about this this morning, just speculating. And even if it had worked, I don't think it would have mattered a whole heck of a lot because if there's 50 ships in the, in the harbor and you blow up one, yeah, they're going to say, how did that blow up? But I don't know if it's going to... You're going to need an army of, of uh, turtles to go under ships and attach things. Can you imagine 50, like getting 50 people to go out under those things? <laughs> I could just see that. And, I, and, and I, I don't mean to laugh, but I was, when I was thinking about him trying to get away from the British ships, you know, you just, you just picture this guy like cranking this propeller through the water and, and you know, you still get, it's not like it's a river like we think of. I mean, it's, it's, you're still getting currents and things of that nature and rough water and, which would bounce the ship too, so, or the, the submersible. So yeah. It, it, this is a little different than, I, I had kind of heard of this story. Um, but once again, <laughs> I know in, in the, uh, one of our previous one on Mustard Gas, I had talked about an uh, author named Rick Atkinson, okay. who wrote the tr a trilogy about World War II. Well, he's working on one on the American Revolution, and his first book came out two years ago called The British Are Coming, and it goes up to Princeton, which is early 1777. But it's really good because he talks about this in there. Oh. And I had kind of known about it, but again, it was something that, unlike the mustard gas things, which I never had any inkling of, I kind of knew about this, but I thought, well, this is kind of interesting because it shows you that, it, you know, and then maybe in some ways Washington was desperate to break what was going on in New York, but of course it didn't happen that way. But you're right, it, it's interesting that this little failed experiment it led to, and there's some gaps in, you know, going from one war to the next. Yeah, but, of course. But it's, but yeah, it's interesting. Wow. That's, that's awesome. And now I was just thinking, the, that little turtle, and now we have nuclear subs. Like, it's, <laughs> yeah. 
starting starting small in terms of underwater warfare. But right, right. And I don't know, you know, we think about non-warfare applications, and yeah, I'm sure there's it led to other things too. Oh yeah, into the water and that. So, but it's like these these tinkers. You know, you think about this in colonial America. There's different people like this, and they're always like watchmakers, and even a clockmaker. You had to know. Yeah, that's very intricate work. Not like we think of it in the clocks then. And so, mm-hmm. I think that it. You know, there's always been sort of this. I don't want to say myth because there's some truth to it, but there's always been sort of you know the American ingenuity or. But of course, it was American ingenuity, but also based on previous things that happened. Too. Yeah, and, and that's how science works. So. And so there are. You said there were um, recreations of of this, right? Yes. Where would where would someone see one of them? Uh, one place I know is the in Connecticut. There is a museum there. Um, and if you actually look up a Wiki, even the Wikipedia. Um, article on this, which, I mean, I'd rather people read the book, but even the Wikipedia has pictures of it, and so you get a better idea of, of, the, of the things about it. Yeah. I think there was a nautical museum in Connecticut, and the three other ones, it, the names escape me right now, okay. off the top of my head. But, um, but, but they, someone could see the, yes. the, basically what it, what it was. Right, and that's the nice thing about this book, really, because it does show you tons of drawings and and. and I think they re, they they re, they did a recreation of it, like in around the bicentennial year, mm-hmm. and in, it was in Connecticut, of course, where that's where it was invented, really. Yeah. So, so yeah, it, just these little things, how they lead to big things, I guess. Yeah. And one more time, what is that book again? It was it's called uh, just called Turtle, David Bushnell's Revolutionary Vessel. Awesome. Thank you, Scott. So Scott, <laughs> next time. You know what we're talking about? Yeah, I do, actually. Um, I was driving to work one day, and I heard a commercial for a true crime podcast. And I know those are all the rage now. So I thought, oh, I could probably think of something. So it's the, I'm going to talk about the theft of the Mona Lisa in 1911 from the Louvre. Okay. And the repercussions that had after that. All right. Awesome. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Well, I'm glad. I hope our listeners are looking forward to it as well. Cool.